We've already at least briefly mentioned how uh, during this period, the middle class professionals, but particularly capitalists, are starting to rise uh, and not only challenge the status and power of the nobility, uh, but uh, along with it, causing a great deal of concern about what does this mean? Uh, how, how can this be interpreted as part of the great chain of being? Where do we place the capitalist class uh, on the great chain of being? And the place we see geographically where the this rising capitalist class, merchant class, bankers, etc., uh, is in the cities. Uh, right? Uh, they're doing their business uh, in the cities. And particularly in capital cities, we start to see this, uh, in a sense, new class, uh, the uh, as Karl Marx would call it, the bourgeoisie, uh, which is a little bit misleading because... Uh, that really is a reference to middle class, but we're talking here about the middle class, you know, merchants, but particularly the, the upper class ones, the ones who make millions and millions. Uh, they're the ones who are really starting to challenge over time the old noble classes, nobility for power. And this is uh, something, a struggle, uh, a major uh, issue that we'll trace uh, really for the rest of this class off and on. Uh, this is a power struggle that's starting to ensue right here and will only get more become more intense as the rising capitalist classes uh, become more and more uh, movers and shakers uh, because they're becoming increasingly wealthy uh, in European society uh, and the nobility that think they're the ones uh, because of tradition uh, that should make the decisions and stay the ones with power, social status, uh, and most of the wealth. Uh, and so the two get along in some ways, particularly in England, but there's a, a long-term conflict about which one of them uh, uh, you know, uh, is and should be more powerful in European society. Uh, Bergen's a book on the 17th century uh, talks about some of these capital cities uh, and some of the uh, you know, uh, major uh, issues uh, in them. Capital cities as such <clears throat> were a recent invention with Madrid in Spain, perhaps one of the strangest examples of rapid urban growth based solely on the needs of a royal court uh, with little economic logic. That is to say that Madrid rose as a big city uh, uh, primarily uh, by merchants who were there just to, to serve the, no, the the royal family and the nobility that lived uh, you know, at the, the royal uh, uh, palace and, and lodgings. Usually, however, uh, economic logic, social diversity, and administrative importance went hand in hand, uh, both for capital cities and for major regional centers. Leipzig, uh, East Germany, uh, Naples, Italy, Lyon, uh, and France and Seville uh, in Spain. Such composite growth created considerable potential friction between the needs and interests of families employed in administrative or military capacities on, uh, and on those of families primarily engaged in finance, trade, and manufacture. Uh, so here we already see in the cities kind of a microcosm of this sort of larger conflict between sort of old uh, traditional uh, ruling classes uh, sort of up and coming uh, mainly uh, business-oriented uh, uh, classes. In times of crisis, such differences could have significant political repercussions, as in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1660, when the city patricians and burghers allied with the king to displace the old military and administrative elite in favor of newer social groups more directly under royal control. One thing that's being alluded to here, though not spelled out very clearly, uh, is... Uh, this conflict that we're tracing here, starting in this unit, old money, nobles versus kind of new money, capitalists, often benefited the king uh, because the king realized quickly, if he had any brains at all, uh, that uh, he could play these two off against each other. Uh, and if he seemed to be favoring one, uh, the other one uh, then might have to make concessions and sort of bow down to the king more. Uh, and so this uh, it gave the king uh, uh, a lot more options in uh, acquiring, holding on to, expanding his own power. Bergen goes on to say that London is perhaps the most striking example of a center with critical economic as well as political functions, capital city. Uh, it encompassed the whole social spectrum from high nobility, senior lawyers and churchmen, through financial and merchant sectors with wide-flung interests to broad manufacturing and service groups supported by a large labor market. It had a thriving cultural life. 
It also uh, had endless opportunity for individuals who felt driven to make their mark, whether as religious reformers, female artists, gentry politicians, aspiring writers, or purveyors of fancy new consumer goods. It provided the perfect hunting ground for pickpockets. Uh, so I, I, did, I could have included more from that section. Didn't have room, of course. Uh, but there's a big downside to city life as well. Uh, though it was the place to go, whether London or you know, Berlin or anywhere else that was a capital or big city, uh, if you wanted to rise in the world, uh, right? Uh, if you wanted to, if, if you wanted, had any uh, chance of social mobility, right? Moving out of the great chain of being and out of that static hierarchy, uh, you pretty much had to go to the cities. You weren't going to be doing it in small towns and in the countryside. Uh, it wasn't going to happen there. But there were lots of dangers, not just pickpockets, but murders, uh, and uh, city life was filthy uh, and uh, you know disease-ridden. So your chances of dying uh, of a disease were much greater in the cities as well. So you were rolling the dice if you were ambitious and wanted to move up the social ladder, uh, you know, and, and and were willing to live in the city to do it. But the cultural life was there. Uh, there was a lot to do, uh, as there is in cities now. So it had its ups and downs. Urbanization and the merchants, uh, right? This became an alternative social order. So this is kind of tacking on to what we've already just said in the last couple of slides about the rise of the merchant uh, and capitalist classes uh, who are increasingly challenging the power uh, and leadership of the old nobility who are still around, but they see the threat and they're trying to fight against it uh, over the long term unsuccessfully. Uh, you probably have already guessed, if you didn't already know, the capitalist classes basically went out in the end by the time we get to the 20th century. But the nobles fight tenaciously uh, and to hold on to as much of their own power and status for as long as they can. Uh, going back to Professor, Professor Dunn, uh, he says, England and the Dutch Republic uh, were fiscally the most effective 17th century states because they were the most commercialized the most business-oriented, the most capitalist-oriented. In the era of the price revolution, which meant uh, an era where there was uh, rising prices, commercial profits proved to be much more elastic than agricultural or industrial profits. Uh, so uh, uh, commerce means trade, uh, right? Merchants sell stuff, buy and sell stuff. They don't necessarily produce it. Uh, so industrial profits means profits from stuff that's produced. Uh, whether it be you know pottery or steel or whatever else it might be, uh, agriculture of course produces you know food, uh, but commercial profits, com uh, you know people involved in commerce are uh, traders, merchants uh, who don't necessarily produce. The Dutch and English governments developed fruitful partnerships with the merchants of Amsterdam and London. In each instance, the state granted commercial privileges and protection to the mercantile community and in return received excise and customs revenues. And uh, able to secure public loans, the government, uh, at tolerable rates of interest. The vigorous Dutch and English traffic in domestic and foreign goods produced greater wealth than the mines, the mines of America. Greater wealth than, the, say, the Spanish had pulled out through gold and silver in the 16th century. Merchants traditionally disdained by priests as moral parasites and by the knights as moral cowards felt confident that they now formed the most dynamic social class, as they did. Uh, behold then the true form and worth of foreign trade, the English merchant Thomas Munn proudly wrote in the 1620s, which is the great revenue of the king, the honor of the kingdom, the noble professions of the merchant, the school of our arts, the supply of our wants, the employment of our poor, the improvement of our lands, the nursery of our mariners, meaning seafarers, uh, the walls of the kingdom, the means of our treasure, the sinews of our wars, the terror of our enemies. Uh, so he's just kind of playing up the importance of his merchant class. <laughs> just kind of. Uh, but it was true, this group was on the rise, and you can see through this guy Mun, because he wasn't alone, the confidence, the rising confidence of the wealthy merchant uh, uh, you know, commercial classes. European guilds and corporations. Guilds were, uh, were kind of on their way out during this time period. They were a creation uh, of the Middle Ages, uh, and so kind of a fossil in certain ways. They didn't you know, relinquish power easily, 
uh, but uh, they're rich on that. By corporations here, we don't necessarily mean like modern day corporations, like big companies. Uh, that 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 was partially true, but it's kind of a different definition of corporation. A corporate body in early modern Europe really meant uh, uh, any kind of sort of uh, organizational group that was run uh, by uh, sort of a, a combined group of interests of, of people. So the merchant classes uh, represented in this picture, famous picture of Dutch merchants, uh, Amsterdam on the left, uh, right their uh, control of say city government uh, in Amsterdam uh, is an example of kind of corporate uh, power. Uh, where uh, kind of an oligarchy of uh, individuals from a particular uh, group, like this social economic group, the merchants. So the, as Professor Buchholz says, each town was dominated by an oligarchy, and the oligarchy controlled the corporation. The corporation consisted of the mayor, the town's council or court of aldermen, uh, and various officers. These officials administered civic government, enforced order, regulated trade and generally uh, made the law, gave orders to keep the streets lit and clear of refuse, uh, to contain the plague, which was reoccurring, uh, and to facilitate poor relief. Uh, goes on to say that just below the corporation in the town, uh, in the town government hierarchy were the guilds. Each small town usually had one guild consisting of all its merchants and craftsmen. In a big town, there would be guilds uh, or companies for each trade or craft. In theory, the guild sought to limit the wild swings of fortune associated with capitalism by acting as a combination of Better Business Bureau, Trade Association for Standards and Practices, Lobbying Group, Fraternity, and Mutual Aid Society, all wrapped up into one. Thus, the guild set prices, wages, and standards of workmanship uh, on locally made products. Uh, the reason that the guilds are on their way out, however, is kind of a transitional period, uh, whereby on the other end of this, they're going to be gone is that they didn't fit uh, with the, the, the growth of capitalism. Why? Because if they're setting prices, wages, and standards of workmanship, uh, that means that sort of anybody in the, uh, the, the uh, let's say, the, the shoemaker's guild, uh, right? they're not competing with each other. Uh, a, a, the guilds are kind of like unions, but they're not organized by workers like our unions usually are. They're organ organized by the owners of businesses in one trade uh, or industry after another. So in a big city, there might be uh, I don't know, 12 different shoemakers that belong to the Shoemakers Guild of that city, and, and they're the owners of their businesses. And what they're doing is kind of colluding uh, in the, uh, through the guilds. Uh, the guild is sort of a larger organization in which they're all members, and it sets prices, wages, etc. Uh, well, that's the opposite of the competition uh, that drives capitalism. Uh, right, uh, we're going to try to undersell our opponents. We're not going to set prices. Uh, we're going to try to sort of become more efficient than them, uh, sell our uh, wares uh, more cheaply, and take all their customers. So uh, the the Middle Ages uh, shows us, going back to it again, uh, that uh, capitalism was still you know very much uh, still on the rise and not there yet, uh, not the dominant force yet because uh, the guilds are one example of many, but a great example of how uh, in, middle, uh, in the Middle Ages in Europe, uh, stability was much more valued than competition. Uh, and I think the guilds are you know, reflective of the desired need uh, for stability and the feeling of stability, uh, right? Uh, wicked, uh, rugged competition, wicked as it was seen, uh, right, was destabilizing. Uh, uh, not stabilizing. So guilds help to stabilize business practices and business competition uh, and smooth it out. But capitalism required the opposite. Uh, so with capitalists on the rise, uh, the guilds are uh, you know, on their way out.